We all thank you for coming. You might notice we've got quite an echo in here. That's because we're redoing the floors. They see how shiny they are. You see how they used to look down there, but all the furniture has been taken out, so that's why it looks like, like this. Um, we're glad to have you all here. This is a, a good news announcement. This is something that everybody here has been very much focusing on for some time, and that is our unemployment insurance fund and the state of business in South Carolina. As you know, South Carolina's business is business. If we don't have our small businesses working, our large businesses growing, everybody working together and all interdependent and connected, if a part of that chain breaks or if any part of it gets sick, we all suffer. So we, one of the main things that we do in South Carolina is be sure that our businesses have what they need, small and large. Most of our businesses are small businesses. But the business of South Carolina is business, and we do all we can to take the taxes off of them and remove regulations that impede the growth and flow of business. And so today we're here to announce that even though we have gone through a terrific pandemic, we will not be raising taxes on the businesses for the unemployment insurance. That is a major accomplishment. And it, uh, credit goes to Accelerate SC, as well as the people you see uh, here today and a lot of others. We were very careful when the CARES money came in. Our General Assembly, listening to Accelerate SC, that group, their recommendations, and discussing and making strong decisions, determined that of the $1.9 billion, $920 million should go to the Unemployment Trust Fund that is paid that is filled by taxes on businesses for the unemployment insurance when people are unemployed. They determined that 920 million of that would, of the 1.9, roughly half, would go to that unemployment insurance fund. And as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that we did not close in South Carolina, we did not go into trying to make the determination between which business was essential and which was not, because every business is essential to those people who depend on it and who own and work at those businesses. Instead, we took a, a different approach and determined which activities, which kinds of businesses, which locations would be the ones where people would congregate and would be most likely to spread the virus, such as barbershops, beauty parlors, some retail stores where items are picked up and touched by others and others all day long. And that is what we limited. We unfortunately closed some some time, but as you know, in South Carolina, we our touch was lighter than most any in the country. We went in in a measured approach using the old carpenter's rule of measure twice and cut once. And don't make mistakes, don't go overbroad, always keeping in mind the fact that the Constitution of the United States says that a government cannot take property from someone without due compensation. And at some point, putting restrictions on a business or on activities amounts to a taking. And that's why you're seeing lawsuits around, around the country. We've had one such lawsuit here, and the judge decided that we did the right thing. But we went in, and then we came out sooner than others did around the country. And as a result of that, our unemployment rate is 5.1 percent. New York, for example, for comparison, is 9.7. California is 11 percent. We've added 118,000 new jobs since uh, just uh, not long ago, since the beginning of all this. And we're, we're coming up. In 2008 and 2009, when that crisis hit, well, we had to, like many other states, we, our trust fund went down. We had to borrow money, and we just finished paying it off just a, a year or so ago. Well, we're not going to have to do that this time because we did things the right way. We consulted, we communicated, we collaborated, we cooperated, and we took a very careful, methodical, determined approach, and it has paid off for the people in South Carolina. And now we're in a position to accelerate even more and to grow out of this pandemic and to get our businesses booming uh, unlike before. So that's the good news. And here to tell about it to begin is Danny Elsey, head of the Department of Employment and Workforce. Mr. Elsey. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. The year 2020 
began as a uh, extremely promising year. All the numbers that we at Employment and Workforce track were very good. Unemployment rate 2.5 percent back in February. Job numbers, we were hitting a record every month they were announced, 2,333,000 in February. Number of unemployed people down to $59,000, 59,000 people a low. Two months later, the bottom had been pulled out from under us and everything turned around. Unemployment rate was up to 12.8 percent. The number of jobs were down to 2,073,000 and the number of unemployed had gone from 59,000 to 303,000. And that was bad enough, but some sectors had it even worse. The hospitality and food services lost half of their jobs as we went through this pandemic. Many of us lived through the 2008-2009 recession and we all heard the economists economists say back then, this is it. It can't get any worse than this unless we go into a, a new depression. Well, if you looked at the month of February and March in South Carolina and the U.S. and compared it to 2008 and 2009, you would say that the Great Recession was pretty mild compared to what we had just gone through. But it didn't last forever. The recovery began under the governor's plan. Much of the businesses reopened safely, I might add. Uh, and the economy responded. Somebody asked me one time in an interview, did the governor reopen the economy at the right time? I said, well, don't ask my opinion, just look at the numbers. And the numbers are this, and by September, the unemployment rate was back down to 5.1%. The job numbers were back up to 2,269,000, and the number of unemployed had dropped from 303,000 down to 121,000. The numbers were good. 75% of all the jobs lost in the state of South Carolina had been regained. In Georgia, only 49%. North Carolina, 56%. U.S. average, 56%. Once again, however, the recovery wasn't even. In the hospitality and food service industry, only 60% 60% of the jobs were recovered. Many employers were still struggling. We stay in touch with employers. We talk to them about how things are going, and we knew that most of them, many of them, could not withstand another shock like what hit them in February and March. It was at about this time that we started our planning every year at about <coughs> fall. We start looking at two things. The tax rate for the following year. What will be the fees assessed to employers to pay benefits for the following year? <coughs> and if we've been in a recession and the trust fund has gone below its goal, then we have to look at a rebuild. Those are the two things that we do. Uh, when you look at the uh, tax rate, the numbers became evident very quickly. If we projected the 2021 benefits to be paid and set the taxes at that level, it would be a doubling of taxes for most employers in the state of South Carolina and added 175 or close to $175 million added to the cost those employers would have to bear that was a shock that we didn't think they could withstand. We looked at the rebuild. The governor said we avoided a borrowing, and, and we did, and that's good. And that's because we were prepared with $1.1 billion in the trust fund at the, uh, at the beginning of this. But even though we didn't have to borrow, the trust fund was way down from $1.1 billion down to about $200 million, which meant we had a massive rebuilding coming and employers were going to have to foot the bill for this in the first four years following the end of the recession. So we looked for a solution. Uh, we met with the governor's office and his support people. We met with the legislative leadership, many of them here today. We talked with the business community, and we looked at CARES Act money. And as the governor said, CARES Act money was used, in my opinion, very wisely. It will support not only businesses, but indirectly every South Carolinian uh, in the state. 500 million was designated immediately, and we have it. Another up to 420 million is available. <clears throat> the legislature authorized us to depart from the normal rule of requiring all the payments from employers. We took the additional money for 2021 from CARES Act money, which is what allowed us to keep the tax rate the same for 2021 as it is for 2020. The remainder of the money, up to approximately 747 million, would be used for the rebuild. So hopefully by doing this, we, no employer will suffer as a general rule an increase in taxes unless they change categories. Now, 
As many of you know, when all this began, we announced we would not charge employers for COVID-related layoffs, and we have not and we will not do that. Some employers, however, are going to change categories from a four to a six or a six to a four because of pre-COVID-19 layoffs or from layoffs that occurred during the pandemic that were not COVID-19 related. But other than that, almost everybody stays exactly the same with no change in, uh, uh, in category. So we thought we had a good game plan, but we also realized we got a lot of unemployed people sitting out there. A lot of people who are on unemployment still, even though the federal programs are both, both of them are, have now expired, uh, the, the supplemental payment programs that is. We had paid out $4.6 billion in unemployment from the beginning of the pandemic through today, $4.6 billion, which kept the economy uh, going. But we know that those programs are coming to an end, and the bottom line is at some point the employees, the claimants, the people drawing benefits have got to return to work. And that has begun now, job one for us at our agency. We're still doing our best to pay benefits when claims come in. We're hearing appeals. We're doing everything we're supposed to. But we now know we've got 120-some thousand employees, claimants, who need to go back to work. The good news is we got about 81,000 open positions in our South Carolina online database right now, positions being sought to be filled by employers. So we know we've got an awful lot of opportunities out there, and we have started a major push to get pack people back to work. Job fairs, how can you do them? You put people together, you got exposure problems. Well, our local areas and our employment services division came up with virtual job fairs, all done on a computer, walk through job fairs, drive through job fairs, all done very, very safely and very innovatively, I might add, by our um, local areas. We have developed the ability <clears throat> to do targeted emails. So if Michelin or someone else announces they need to hire 50 people in Spartanburg County, we can look at a traveling range that most people have for these jobs. Let's assume it's 40 miles. And we could look at everything within 40 miles and everyone within manufacturing experience. And everybody that came up on that search is going to get a targeted email from us saying, Michelin's hiring, high paying jobs, you're qualified, go to the job fair or go online and apply. <clears throat> we are doing these by the hundreds of thousands um, each month. We will soon launch what we're calling Project Job One, which is going to be a major <coughs> communication effort <coughs> aimed at getting employees to go ahead uh, and start looking for a job now. Don't wait till the end. And we're going to be laying out research that says if you're unemployed and you want a good job, go get them now because the good jobs go first. And if you wait to the end of this whole recession and you take it, according to some research, you will not get one of the good jobs. We're going to try to motivate people uh, back into the, uh, into the workforce. There's been a lot of work done on this, and a lot of the people who are standing behind me uh, contributed greatly uh, to this plan. The governor's office, as I said, the legislative leadership, they've all been uh, wonderful to work with, and everybody very, very concerned about not only businesses, but individuals in the uh, state of South Carolina. Uh, one of the main people we work with is going to be the next speaker. He's the uh, chairman of LCI, Senator Thomas Alexander. Thank you, Director LZ, and appreciate your leadership and the hard work that you and your team have done throughout this uh, period of time since, I guess, back in March. Uh, there was no way for anyone to envision what was ahead of the state of South Carolina, and I would tell you that under your leadership and the efforts of your team uh, in these difficult, challenging times, y'all have risen to the occasion to help the citizens of our state of South Carolina. And I want to publicly thank you for your work uh, and that of your team at this particular time. And to our governor, governor, thank you for your leadership and for what you did and you alluded to it earlier in, in creating Accelerate South Carolina. Uh, that brought all sectors from across the state together, business sectors, other partners uh, together to see what the future of South Carolina needed to be about in this COVID-19 environment. And it is uh, under that uh, overview of Accelerate South Carolina, as those recommendations came together, uh, that we in the General Assembly, but more specifically in the State Senate, we took those recommendations um, 
uh, uh, President Peeler, uh, Harvey Peeler from Cherokee, appointed the Reopen South Carolina Committee that I had the pr privilege to chair. Uh, we took those recommendations uh, uh, that included the $500 million initially in phase one uh, for the uh, uh, trust fund. Uh, that was a, 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 a great uh, committee to be a part of. Uh, we uh, had bipartisan uh, support. We had bipartisan subcommittee. We had the senator from Darlington, Senator Malloy. We had the senator from Kershaw, Senator Shaheen. We had the senator from Buford, Senator Davis, senator from Lexington, Senator Sheely, the senator from Clarendon, Senator Johnson, and the senator from Greenville, Senator Turner, as part of that subcommittee. We brought those recommendations to the Finance Committee and the Chairman Leatherman supported those and under his leadership directed us through the Senate to have the initial 500 million of the CARES Act and then phase two, the additional up to $420 million has been authorized. So that's kind of where we were, but I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that before this in March, we were virtually fully funded at $1.1 billion in the trust fund. A lot of that had been the work of the majority leader, uh, my friend, Senator Massey, it had also been the work of one of the members of the Accelerate South Carolina, former Senator Greg Ryberg, because of the, the reform of the Department of Employment and Workforce and the trust fund after the recession of 2008 to 2010. I want to be clear that the business community had paid virtually all of the debt back, the, the Senate the, in the General Assembly had contributed a, a few, um, some of those funds, but the majority of the money that was paid back to the federal government was by the business community, all sectors, all sizes of business. But then you have the rebuild uh, that we did that brought the $1.1 billion to fully fund the reserve account every dime every dime in that reserve account was funded by the business communities of South Carolina. Now, I personally, I think the federal government utilized uh, those funds and uh, when we went through this area of, of the, of the COVID-19, they utilized to get money directly into those that have been unemployed and been hit uh, by, by the virus. It was effective to get money uh, into those individuals' hands, into the economy to help meet those needs. So I, I commend them from that standpoint, but it has drained our trust fund. And so this commitment by the General Assembly to restore that, but more importantly, this over $170 million that the director alluded to and that the governor alluded to will preclude any type of rate increase on any class of the business community, uh, and there's 20 different classes uh, as a result of the virus. And as uh, Director Elsie mentioned, now, if there was other things outside of the virus that caused you to go from one class to another, that would be based like we would have from any other year. But it has been a partnership, it's been bipartisan, it has been people working together for the betterment of the citizens of the state, for the betterment of our business community for this state, and indeed for the betterment of all of our citizens of the state of South Carolina has brought us here today, but there's been no more important partner for us. As you look back here, you have the executive branch, you have the director of the agency, but you have the business partners. They're the ones that are providing jobs for our citizens, the employees across South Carolina, and our employers by us working together. Uh, we'll get, we'll, we are delighted that we don't have any, any type of a rate increase for this next year, because again, we're in uncharted territory of knowing what the economy will be, and we want to make sure that our businesses are set for success and not having to pay additional revenue to, to a fund to rebuild at this particular time, that we want to be able to make sure uh, that they survive, that they thrive, and that South Carolina moves forward after this. So it's a pleasure to be a part of this today. It's been a, part, a pleasure to be a part of us bringing uh, this opportunity of making sure that we're supporting the business community as they support our state. And at this time, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present someone that I think so highly of, that I'm delighted as a colleague, but more importantly to have as a friend, the majority leader of the South Carolina Senate, 
who has really championed uh, the business causes, not only this, but other causes, but has been instrumental as well as others in making sure that not only was the reform done, uh, but that we've addressed uh, this through the CARES Act. So, uh, Senator Massey, the senator from Edgefield. Oh. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Senator. Good morning, everybody. You know, we, um, we often talk about how government responds or doesn't respond to a crisis or a problem. We don't often talk about what government does on the front end to prevent a calamity from happening. This is one of those times. Uh, as you've heard already, we were looking at the, at the likelihood of doubling of unemployment tax rates. That's a big deal for business. Uh, that would clearly have had an impact on our overall economy. Uh, and, and, and what we've heard today is that much of this is because of the CARES Act funding that we were able to stabilize. But a lot of this really is because of some very difficult decisions that were made after the 2008 recession. Because at that point, remember, we had to borrow a billion dollars from the federal government to pay our unemployment claims. Since that time, decisions were made, changes were made that allowed us to pay off that debt but also to rebuild our trust fund to over $1.1 billion heading into to this situation. Y'all, we were in a much better position in South Carolina than most of the other states. We were in a great position heading into to the recession. We knew a recession was coming. As Director Elsie said, we didn't know this kind of a, of a hit was coming. But we were as prepared as we possibly could have been, and that's because of some very difficult decisions that were made over 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of that is because of business involvement in making this happen. A lot of that is because of elected officials, some of whom, as Senator Alexander referenced, are no longer serving. A lot of people came to the table to make those things happen. And that's, we're seeing the results of that today, even though it was painful. It was painful in 2009, and 2010, and 2011, and paying off some of that debt. What we see now is that those hard decisions made this worth it. Um, but we were looking at the very real possibility because of some of those changes that were made, the formulas that were created, that you were going to see a doubling of tax rates. And that's because one of the things that goes into this formula is, as Director Elsie said, do projects what the payouts are going to be for the following year. And the law says that we have to collect enough taxes to pay off that projected payout. That was going to result in the doubling of taxes. Look, if we had done that, if we had allowed that to happen, it would have had a major impact on business across the state. Uh, it certainly would have had a negative impact on business productivity. You also almost certainly would have seen fewer people employed because of the increased taxes that businesses would have had to pay. I think it's important that we celebrate government doing something really right, and that is we prevented, government prevented, government in collaboration with the business community prevented a major disaster happening with unemployment in 2021 and with business success in 2021. But this couldn't have happened without involvement of the business community. One of the leaders in the business community, of course, is the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce. Ted Pitts is the president and CEO. Ted. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to be here today. And first thing I want to do is I want to thank state leadership. You know, obviously you just heard from the majority leader, Shane Massey, um, Senator Thomas Alexander, uh, Representative Bill Sandifer, Chairman of Senate Finance, um, Senator Leatherman, Chairman of Ways and Means, Merle Smith, um, uh, Democrats and Republicans, the Speaker, you know, we appreciate um, what they've done in this case because they have saved jobs in South Carolina. Um, the Governor talked about Accelerate SC, and I can tell you as I talk to colleagues around the country, we're lucky here in South Carolina that Governor McMaster took the approach that he took um, related to the pandemic and our economy. And you know, the one thing I give Accelerate SC credit is there was a lot of feedback, a lot of input, and um, that was listened to, and it was put into a proposal. And the General Assembly, like I said, Republican, Democrat, House, Senate, got behind those proposals. And you know, at the end of the day, they saved jobs. Director Elsey, you talk about the workload that's been put on a state agency you know, over the last eight months. I can tell you that as South Carolinians, we need to thank him and his agency for the work they've done. They have very quickly 
uh, adapted to the pandemic and the, the repercussions that come from a flood of unemployment claims. They have quickly filled those claims. And they'll tell you it hasn't been perfect, but it's been very efficient and very effective, and we thank him. So I will tell you, like Senator Massey said, this is one of those things that they're probably not going to get a letter in the mail when they get home that says government worked, good job. But from a business community perspective, coming out of the 2008, 9, 10, um, when tax rates were increased because we had to rebuild the trust fund, the business community thanks you and employees that don't even know across South Carolina that if the General Assembly and the executive branch hadn't come together to do this, they probably wouldn't have a job right now. So we want to thank you. Thank you very much. And next, I want to turn it over to a, a very close partner of the South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance and their president and CEO, Sarah Hazard. Thanks, Ted. Um, as Ted mentioned, my name is Sarah Hazard. I'm president and CEO of the South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance. On behalf of our state's manufacturers, it's hard to believe that exactly one year ago, almost to the day that we were here celebrating a decade-long effort to rebuild our state's unemployment insurance trust fund. Then, in a matter of months, that accomplishment was practically wiped out by COVID-19, which is why today's announcement is so critically important to South Carolina's business community. The South Carolina Manufacturers Alliance appreciates Governor McMaster, Senator Alexander, Senator Massey, and other legislative leaders, and DEW Director Dan Elsey, for recognizing the critical need to replenish the state unemployment insurance trust fund and for freezing the 2021 unemployment insurance tax rates at the 2020 levels. Without the $920 million allocated from the Federal CARES Act funding, the average unemployment insurance tax rates on South Carolina businesses would have doubled. Using these funds to keep rates reasonable is a vital step in supporting South Carolina's economic recovery. We are encouraged that many employers are starting to hire again, and we look forward to continuing to work with Governor McMaster, the General Assembly, and SEDEW to ensure the stability of the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund and to make sure that South Carolina continues to be one of the best states to do business. And with that, I'd like to introduce the um, State Director for the National Federation of Independent Businesses, Ben Hermeyer. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Governor McMaster, uh, Chairman Alexander, Chairman Massey, uh, Director Elsey, for talking about such an important issue for business here in South Carolina. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the State Director for the National Federation of Independent Business, and I represent over 4,000 small businesses here in the state. I want to give you some quick numbers about small business in South Carolina. There are over 400,000 registered small businesses in the state. This equates to about 99% of all business. Over 800,000 people in South Carolina work in a small business. These are your main street retail shops, your, your plumber, your restaurants. You know, these are the lifeblood of South Carolina. Those of us who came through the last economic downturn over a decade ago recall how devastating the bankruptcy of the UI Trust Fund was and how the rate changes that went along with it were especially to small business, but to business all throughout South Carolina. It took years to recover, as you've heard. You know, when COVID first hit in March, those of us in the business community began having talks about what was gonna come next. You know, Governor McMaster and his staff and Director Elsey and his staff called a number of us right away. And those discussions immediately turned to discussions with the General Assembly. Um, Senator Alexander has been involved with UI and workforce as long as I recall. You know, Senator Massey, Senator Leatherman, Chairman Smith, Chairman Luke, or Speaker Lucas, and so many members of the General Assembly, both sides of the aisle, got together. COVID task force were formed. The Governor's Accelerate SC group was formed. And as you heard uh, from Senator Alexander, uh, Senator Ryberg, who was involved with UI reform from the beginning, took up this issue and, and got to work right away. We saw unemployment numbers grow, and, and it, was, it was staggering. You know, I have spoken with folks in neighboring states, and they are in awe of what South Carolina was able to do and able to accomplish working with the governor and working with the General Assembly, putting this $920 million in place, freezing the rates, getting our trust fund to be solvent again. Uh, multiple states are looking at bankruptcy, which, which we are not going to have, and we are so lucky that we have been able to work together with this. Uh, the General Assembly, the Governor, Director Elsey, we all work together, and that is, I think, the biggest thing here is that you can hear about South Carolina is, as the Governor has always said, the business of South Carolina is business. 
and being able to work together, bringing all of our folks back to work, small and large, is so important for all of us, and, and this is just one great step going forward. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the governor, who's here to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thank all of you all for, for being here. Uh, to give you sort, sort of a, a picture of this, I watched the other, other night the, the newest version of the movie Poseidon. You all, all saw that Poseidon adventure where the, here came the big wave and the ship wasn't quite ready and they couldn't quite turn it into the wave to avoid getting flipped. Well, that's what happened here with, the, with this tsunami that we call the COVID-19 pandemic. But unlike a lot of other ships of state that got turned over and rolled because they had not taken the steps that we had taken both years ago and just recently when it arrived, wise, very careful steps, they rolled over, they're having trouble, and, and we were able to go through that wave. We're coming out the other side now. And the future looks good. Now, I want to stress that the virus is not gone. We still, uh, we're still suffering. There have been tragedies, but we know a lot more about it now than we knew then. And I urge people to remember also, when it gets cold and everybody comes inside, you got to be more and more careful because that's where, that's where this virus spreads. So we need to be careful. But we know those things now. Just as from our experience, those you see here and others involved in making these decisions, we made the right decisions and we were able to turn our ship of state directly into that threat. And as a result, we've, we're coming out of the other side and we're in good shape with uh, all engines intact except for a few. And we will rev them up soon and our economy is, is going to leap forward. Uh, we are confident. So if anyone has questions, we'll be glad to try to answer them. Yes, sir. It just so happens I've got that number for you here. It is uh, $886 million as of this moment. That's after paying claims yesterday. I'm not sure I heard the last part of your question, but but is, the. Is there any concern in the future that the state has to raise this tax back up? Well, I mean, obviously, if the pandemic continues and unemployment flares back up again, then we'll be looking at future issues. But right now, as things are going, the trust fund has been steadied with the CARES Act money. The rebuild has been taken care of. The tax increase for 2021 has been taken care of with with CARES Act money. So we are in good shape there. Now we have to, every year, we have to reformulate what the goal is for the trust fund. It was 1.1 billion. Dr. Von Nessen over here is my expert on all this, but uh, all this 1.1 billion, it's gonna go up. And it's gonna go up because we look at a three year average in the past. And last year's average is high. 2020's average is high. It's gonna push that number up above 1.1. So at some point we'll have to start looking at that. But, as the economy is going right now, I see no increase in taxes. If something bad happens, it'll be a whole new ball game this time next year when we're looking at it. What is your message to those unemployed still out there right now looking for work but just can't find a job and are relying on the money from the organization to get them through to pay their bills? What is your message to them today? Well, my message is keep looking. There are jobs out there. There are not necessarily jobs in your area where you need it, and that's one of our big problems. We'll have jobs in the Piedmont, we'll have unemployed people in the PD area, 
and obviously it's, it's difficult to, um, to match them. Uh, one thing we are doing is offering free Coursera. You all heard of the Coursera training program. We negotiated a deal free for all unemployed people in the state of South Carolina. 4,000 of them have taken advantage of, advantage of it, taking something like 15,000 different courses, so you can see multiple courses, where they can get certificates. So that person sitting in the PD whose total background is manufacturing may get a certificate in cyber security and be able to get an entry-level job in that. So we're focusing heavily on training. We're focusing heavily on targeting people with the emails that I mentioned so people don't have to do all the searches themselves. We can say, here is something you are qualified for. You need to go apply, and here's how to do it. Now, we can't make them go apply. Uh, the uh, tax, the uh, unemployment programs will run out someday. Uh, my guess is CARES Act, the next version, will have another program. You know, we had the, uh, the first CARES Act program, FPUC, then we had the presidential lost wages assistance, both of which put billions of dollars into our economy. So it, it was uh, money well spent and, and unemployed uh, certainly could use it. But at some point, they're going to need to start getting out looking for jobs. At some point, we're going to be reestablishing the job search requirement, which will require them to make two job searches. We, we waived that when, when the governor signed the uh, uh, emergency declaration. At some point, we're going to be putting that back in. Now, we will communicate it like crazy because we know it's going to cause problems. And when there are problems, the call centers get deluged and everybody gets complaints about uh, the fact that things aren't going as well as they should. So we'll communicate it like crazy. But when that happens, they're going to have to go in and do the job searches. We're trying to encourage them now to get out there and do it. And our, our theory behind it is unemployment money is good, but a better job is better. Now get out and get it while they last, or you're going to wind up taking what's left at the end of this whole thing. Also, uh, job searches, Director, do you guys have any numbers as far as people just stopping looking for work? Because that can drive the So we got about 120 some thousand people, uh, uh, unemployed people in the state right now. But remember, unemployed, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics, is different than drawing benefits from us. So you got two different numbers. Unemployed for Bureau of Labor Statistics just means you don't have a job, but you're looking. If you don't have a job and you're not looking, you, you go out of the labor force. You're not part of the unemployed uh, even. Uh, we don't have numbers on how many people have stopped looking. We have numbers on how many people are looking. Forty-some thousand people did job searches last week. Dr. Elsie, um, do you have a general number of how many small businesses have had to shut down? I do not have that. We don't track that. Commerce, I think, does track it, but we do not. So, uh, at once a month, uh, NFIB does put together something like that, and, and we know the numbers were roughly around 10 percent, but we do know that without the help like this, without help like the Small Business Grant Program that was, was put together through the General Assembly and the Governor's Office, those numbers were going to rise to about 20 percent before Christmas time, and that was looked at uh, both here in South Carolina and nationally. And will probably not come back. Well, we, we do not know what is going to happen with if there will be a new stimulus package or what it will consist of. Those are things beyond our, our control at, at this level. But we do know that, that we in this state have a, a as vigorous and perhaps more vigorous program than any other state has been described by Mr. Elsie and others in getting people back to work in South Carolina. So, And, and our grants are for small business and nonprofits has been uh, highly successful in the number of applicants for that. The word got out very well about that. I, I, I hope that the that the the uh, citizens uh, realize that there are a lot of jobs available right now. It, they need to need to look for them, and we've ha we have um, the the website and other places, other facilities set up to help them find those jobs. But we, we're going to have to work our way out of this. Yes, ma'am.
given that folks are going to be going home for Thanksgiving, uh, maybe going out of state, maybe back in. Is there any concern for the businesses that are just now figuring out how to deal with it? Yes. So Oh, there, there's always concern. I mean, there, this is something we deal with every day. We get information uh, for in, in Department of Employment and Workforce and DHEC and the uh, Department of Aging and, and everything in between. Oh, and we, we are concerned, particularly concerned in the in the holiday season when and as, as it gets colder, particularly people group up inside. There's no ventilation. That people are close. A lot of times it's families. And we just, we want to urge people, they have to be very, very careful. The, uh, our, our hospitals, uh, the one thing uh, that is, uh, has been encouraging throughout is our, our hospitals have uh, ample space. Uh, the, we, we think we know a lot more about the virus than we did then. We, we know how, how to manage it. We ha have not been able to control it, of course. But if, if people will be just very careful, and I know they'll be hearing this a lot between now and, and, and Thanksgiving, to be very careful. It's still here, even if you're home, the virus might be there with you. So be very careful and don't forget all the, all the warnings and all the measures that each person must take in order to remain healthy. Governor, yes, ma'am. Well, that's what we've been telling people is they, they know how to combat the virus, know how to protect themselves. Those decisions are best made at the local level because the, lo the municipalities and the counties know their businesses, know their people, know the activities that go on, whether they're inside, outside. They, if they go, want to impose fines, they know the, the correct uh, amount of fine, what would, what would be right, what would be wrong. And they have an enforcement mechanism. We have 200, about 250 state law enforcement agents in South Carolina. A lot of our cities have more police officers than that, or sometimes many more. This is a... a question of local enforcement, local determination, follow the rules. Everyone ought to know them by now. But those decisions are best made by the people who will be called upon to enforce those decisions. Are there any more questions? Yeah, the unemployment trust fund. Yeah, yeah it's, it's about unemployment. Uh, the state used to offer 26 weeks of state unemployment benefits. They cut it down after the Great Recession to 20 weeks. Now we see a lot of people using up all 20 weeks, especially in a situation like this where we have an extended recession. Uh, is there, you know, do you think the South Carolina should consider extending it back to 26 weeks per, per situation? Well, one, one thing to remember is the, the, the federal programs that were enacted extended that greatly. Mr. Elsey. So, in addition to our 20 weeks, everyone gets 13 weeks of PEUC. <clears throat> they have been getting 10 weeks of extended benefits, which we will be triggering out of shortly because of our unemployment rate going down, which is a, uh, a good thing. Uh, our 20 weeks, we look at the average throughout. We study that. We look at minimums. We look at maximums. We compare ourselves to uh, uh, other uh, uh, agencies throughout the Southeast and the nation. And throughout the Southeast, we are very, very competitive in terms of uh, uh, our weekly pay and our weekly amounts that we provide. Now, will we look at it? That's a, uh, that's a policy issue made by people outside of my agency. That's the governor. That's the uh, uh, legislature. <clears throat> they, they can uh, set that at a uh, different number of weeks. You can argue it a number of different ways. <clears throat> people who've got 26 weeks, paid 26 weeks out of their trust fund before their people kicked into PEUC. Had the whole thing ended after that, they would have lost that money. We're, our people triggered in the PEUC after 20 weeks. So you, you can argue it a number of different ways. You, you take care of the trust fund with a 20-week uh, maximum much better than you do with 26. You could go back and add more at the end if you wanted to once the federal program's ended. And I know you mentioned that the hospitality industry is still struggling to recover at the same numbers. Is there any kind of program or anything that you guys do or anyone up here that's just going to try to bring folks back into that industry yeah, well, the, uh, the hospitality and, and restaurant got hit a, a double whammy when, when the FPUC came in. 
So you got somebody who's working at a restaurant making $15 an hour, that's $600 a week. He goes, he gets laid off when the restaurant closes. <clears throat> he gets $300 of South Carolina unemployment insurance. <clears throat> and then he gets $600 of FPA, federal money. That person is now earning $900 for sitting at home. The restaurant calls him to come back to work. He's not real anxious to come back to work at that point. He'll take a $300 a week cut and pay and have to get up and go to work every day. So they are dealing with that in terms of uh, what we call recall resistance. We have set up a task force within our agency that deals with any employer who's having difficulty with uh, uh, recalling laid off employees. They have to do it properly. They have to make a pro proper offer and they have to report it to us. And if that occurs, we do cut off unemployment benefits for people who have a job and refuse to return to work. Oh, yeah. If, well, it, it goes both ways. For those who are changing classifications, if they go down, then their tax rate will go down. If they go up, their tax rate will go up. None of those charges, however, are based on COVID-related layoffs. Post-pandemic, COVID-related. If it's pre-pandemic, happened in January, it's charged to them. If it happened, you shut down a department because you moved work to a plant in North Carolina, nothing to do with COVID, they're charged with that. Well, I don't, but this uh, person at the end knows. 13 percent. Any more questions? Thank you for coming. Great job.